and welcome to The Other Marthas, the show where a drama student and a film graduate try to make sense of things we wish we were qualified in instead, with an emphasis on history, mystery and all things morbid. A quick disclaimer before we get started, we don't claim to be experts in any of the fields we'll be discussing, so while everything we say will be based on individual research, it's all a bit of fun and we suggest that you take everything we say with a pinch of salt. I'm Martha, I'm the drama student. And I'm the other Martha, the film graduate. So Martha, what are we talking about today? Today, I am telling you about the life of Mary Bowser. Ooh, Ooh, I have no idea how that is. (laughs) And it's more exciting that way. Um, Also, in this story, quite a prominent member of this story is Elizabeth Van Loo. But Mm -hmm. she's sort of the supporting artist to (laughs) Mary's life. Okay. So... Also, I want to preface this. I know that we have our disclaimer, but (laughs) I need another disclaimer. Oh, no. (laughs) Because I did my best with the research, but there's so many different accounts of what happened, Uh. some of which Mary is kind of known to have made up herself. (laughs) Um, And so... There's a th- there are some things that I've included in this account that historians are like that didn't happen. Okay. But we aren't historians, nope. and we like a fun story. And if We're Mary wanted us to talk about it, you know, let's talk about it. So I'll reserve you know, judgment if- on that until I know what Mary did. But but yeah, that sounds good. Oh, you'll like Mary. She's a good. Oh, good. Okay. She's a goodie. But. Um, also, <laughs> so yeah, my point is some people might know about this and if you do know about it and I am talking w- about things and you're like, that definitely didn't happen. Soz. So <laughs> our, story, our story follows um, Mary, mm. born Mary Jane Richards in around 1840-ish because no one knows when she was born. Um because she was born into slavery and was owned by the Van Loo family. Following John Van Loo's death, who he's the guy who owns all the slaves, in 1843, Elizabeth and her mother freed all of the slaves that the family owned. Oh, yay! they used $200,000 in today's money to buy the relatives of the slaves they owned that were owned by different people and also freed them. It's lovely. However, here come the historians because people say that that's it's kind of disputed that they did this because in Virginia at the time, you couldn't legally free a slave. Ah, I was going to so, say because abolition wasn't for a while. Yeah, that, so it? I don't I don't know what they did. No one's told me that. They've just said that, that you couldn't. But they've not offered an alternative <laughs> so, narrative. But it's it seems like there was an attempt made because yeah. there's evidence of them making an attempt, but I don't know. Something happened. You see how this whole thing's going to go? I do, I do. Yeah. So among the freed, that's mm. I did the little finger thing, you know, where you don't believe something, um, was Mary, <laughs> Mary Jane Richards. Hooray. And she, yay! And she was around, she was around three years old oh. when she was freed. And I was like... Where are this girl's parents? Well, mm. here's another thing we don't know. So Mary and also other people have said different things. Um, some people think Mary's mother was a slave, which would make sense because mm-hmm. she was born into slavery. Um, some people think that her father was Cuban, Spanish and black. And also some people think that Mary's mother was white and some people think that nobody knows who Mary's parents are. So I'm going with um, you don't know who they are. Yeah, that's fair. The point is no one knows who Mary's parents are because I was like, hey, why aren't her parents looking after her if they've all been freed? Mm. Why did what happened next happen? Because no one knows, I think. Um, So what happened next was Mary was employed to work as a servant for the Van Loo family. Kind of odd because she's three three years old. Um, (laughs) I don't know what three-year-old can do as a servant. Maybe they're washing up. Maybe, I liked washing maybe. up when I was three. Oh, I mean, not um, very effectively, presumably. Maybe. Do you think it would have been because if they just freed a three-year-old and her caregivers were sort of non-apparent, 
then it's mm-hmm. like, well, what's this this three year old black child going to do? Someone else is just going to pick her up and enslave her. So maybe they were like, oh, oh well, yeah, for sure. if we employ her, then we're, yeah, she, they probably we can just yeah. take her into the household. Well, so she was she was given a lot of special treatment. So she was baptized at the Saint John's at Saint John's Church, um, which was their family church on May seventeenth, eighteen forty six. And generally, the Van Loo slaves were baptised at Richmond's first African church. Mm. So they seemed to like her. Yeah, yeah. Which I guess, good good for her. And then, she was, when she was a bit older, she was sent to the north, maybe Philadelphia, Ooh. there's rumours of other places, for her education. Hmm. So they seemed to be t- taking care of her. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah. I read one book that was like, they were best buddies. <laughs> mm, I don't go that far. Yeah. Um, she didn't have a lot of choice in who her best buddies were, but okay. Yeah. Um, so after completing her formal education, she's around 14 at this point, I think. Um, but you can do the maths. <laughs> in December 1855, Mary sailed with a group of missionaries from Sandy Hook, New York to... Monrovia, Liberia. Mary stayed in Liberia until 1860, but was unhappy there and requested to Elizabeth that she would be allowed to return to America. (laughs) When she returned to Richmond, she was arrested because they had a law that free black people who had left to the free states and abroad for their education Mm. weren't allowed back in. Oh, God. So this is I was that I was wondering that. So um she was she had to travel north and also was allowed to be educated like normally, quote unquote, in the north because the north had kind of freed its slaves at this point. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. So this is like right before the Civil War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. American Civil War. Yeah. But the With South was like, we uh farm and we're racist. So So she was arrested. Um, Elizabeth paid her bail after Mary had spent 10 10 days, 10 days in jail. Then they somehow got around this law. And I think it was because Mary pretended slash allowed herself to be mistaken as Elizabeth's slave. Uh, So they were like sneaky about getting her back in. That sounds sensible. Must have been slightly humiliating, but sensible. Around this time, we see evidence of Mary starting to change her name to protect herself. Mm. So this is another reason why Mary's really hard to track through the historical record, because she goes by Mary, which is why I'm calling her Mary and not Bowser or Richards. Mm. I see, I see. She changes her name so much that otherwise I would have to keep changing her surname to tell her. Yeah, that would be confusing. (laughs) Yeah, so she she would just often change her surname or her middle name and her surname. Okay. Here, however, Mary legitimately changed her name. On Ooh. April 16th, 1861, uh, she married a fellow servant of the Van Loo family called Wilson Bowser. Oh. And then she became known as Mary Elizabeth Bowser. Very nice. And then we never hear from Wilson again. So <laughs> she also married another guy later. All oh, right. Denham was his surname, as in Denham. Yeah. Uh, And we never hear of him again after they got married either. So. Clearly she eclipses the fame of her husband. Yes. Um, Four days after their wedding, the Civil War broke out. Oh, boy. Here's where we go on a bit of an Elizabeth trip. Mm -hmm. So bear with me. July 1861. Elizabeth begins volunteering as a nurse at Libby Prison, which was a converted tobacco factory holding Union soldiers. Just for people who don't know, because there might be, the Confederate soldiers are the ones who love slavery, and the Union soldiers are the ones that don't like slavery, and also other things. I once read a book, it was um, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. Oh, I love that book. in it... It was so good. But in it, it it's by Mildred D. Taylor, um, they kept talking about the Union... And mm. I, no, you're right. The politics went totally over my head. Yeah. Here's the thing, Martha. It went over your head. I read it as onion, the whole <laughs> book. So I was like, God, they really love onions in this book. <laughs> and 
I knew onion wasn't spelled that way. But phonetically, union and onion. Uh, yeah, that's true. Back to Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. So she started sneaking in supplies for the soldiers, um, like clothes, blankets, food, and medicine. However, hidden in the gifts were messages or plans on how to escape the prison. Oh, so cool. And um, Elizabeth had a 50-foot space, get your paws ready, 50 feet, space <laughs> built in her attic to hide the escaped soldiers. And okay. so not only was she risking herself putting the messages in, she also then was sheltering them in her home. Oh, damn. Good on yeah. Elizabeth. That's cool. What happened was... General Benjamin Butler, a Mm -hmm. Union military leader, learnt of Elizabeth's efforts and he recruited her to his network of spies. And Elizabeth soon started to build her own spy ring of over 12 agents. No one knows how many there were. We'll get on to why. Because they were spies. And she started using all sorts of like little spy techniques like (laughs) invisible ink that could be activated by milk. Oh, nice. So we're getting into some espionage, guys. Ah, love espionage. And now we're back to Mary. So Mary was a really important member of Elizabeth's spy ring. Mm -hmm. Um, And what she did was uh, in Richmond, Virginia at the time, uh, Richmond, Virginia is where the Confederate White House was. Mm. So the Confederate leader, Jefferson Davies, is in the same state the same town as Mary and Elizabeth. Oh boy. So what they do is Mary goes and starts working at parties for the Davies oh. household. Okay. And once she has done a couple of these parties, she is hired as a full-time domestic servant in their house. Damn. Scary. So Mary would clean the house and attend to the military leaders during the meetings like serving drinks and stuff like that Mm. uh, while the military leaders and Davies were chatting about all of their plans Mm. and because they were racist Mm. they assumed that she was uneducated illiterate just generally stupid right and they would discuss their full-on military plans in front of her sometimes people's prejudice makes them so like so vulnerable to any kind of um infiltration because they're they're just so stupid yeah this is this is moby dick and the cannibals all over again being like yes we're we're prejudiced (laughs) against these people because we think this about them so we're not going to go there well and they end up eating each other oh yeah I forgot about that bit yeah so this is the same thing where people are just being stupid so not only would they just full-on discuss all of their military plans in front of her Mm. um he would also Davies would also just leave all of his letters and all of his maps and plans (laughs) just all over everywhere and she would be dusting and reading all of the plans um so cool and Here's where it gets even worse for the Confederates. Mm. Mary had a photographic memory and could recall entire conversations from memory. That's incredible. What a queen. And um, (laughs) and I just love that so much that they're just like, oh, we'll just let this this stupid girl tend to us. And then she she knows words like bring us tea, and that's that's probably the extent of it. No need to imagine that she she knows other things. It's kind of like, you know, in films where um, char- like people, someone's like in another country mm. and everyone's like, oh, they don't speak our language. Yes. So we'll like gossip about them or the fact we're going to kill them in front yeah. of them in our language. And then there's always a badass like- scene where they respond in Russian and then the, the bad guy's <laughs> like, you speak Russian. Yeah. I yeah. thought that was going to happen in Queen's Gambit, but um, <laughs> have you watched Queen's Gambit? I haven't actually. It's so good. I've heard but- good things. I was creating such conspiracy theories about what's going to happen. Like mm. any time anything happens, because Beth is so like vulnerable, right. I was like, oh my God, this is going to happen. We have to keep her safe. Oh, I don't oh. want to keep watching it because this is going to happen. And like, 
I mean, some of my theories came true, but for the most part, I was being very protective and dramatic. And, like, <laughs> That's quite I sweet. I was just, sorry, just continuing on that line. I, I really like that trope of people underestimating people and that meaning that the people mm. that they're underestimating are able to pull off just the most badass things. Like I remember even, this happens a lot in, in kids' books, I think, where it's just adults discussing things and assuming that it's going to go over the kids' heads and the kids yeah. take it all in. Um and then I also remember in the Roman Mysteries series by Caroline Lawrence, which I used to love when I was younger. In the Roman Mysteries. Absolutely loved them. Um, uh, Lupus, who uh, is a, a boy who's mute because his tongue has been cut out. Um, yeah, I remember him. He was my favourite character. Yeah, so cool. Um, he often will will kind of go on reconnaissance missions because because he is mute, people tend to assume that he's deaf mute even though they have, li- right. there's no reason for them to assume that, but they're just like, oh, he can't say anything. He probably has no idea what's going on. And he absolutely, obviously, like, does and can hear them and can report that back to people who can understand what he's saying because he can write and sign. Um, yeah. This is really cool. I That stretched up a memory of a fantasy book I read where... Mm there are people who have their tongues cut out and so they're like oh don't worry we can speak freely in front of them they haven't got any tongues and it's like they could they could write or act is out this the a like, boxes in the hunger games because i always thought that it isn't but that's another one mm. yeah where it's like, yeah, it's like you, you are so aware cool. that in life people are mute and are able to fully communicate like it's, yeah it's not like my god there's there's no speech whatever will they do like we there are so many ways of communicating that trope of people being massively underestimated and allowed to get away with a lot of stuff is common in this story, especially Mm. because not only was Mary just assumed to be stupid, but Mm. Elizabeth, the reason people were suspicious that Elizabeth was helping the Union soldiers, Mm -hmm. her nickname was Crazy Bet because Uh she would like go around the town like muttering to herself or like acting like she could see stuff she couldn't. And she as far as we know didn't have any sort kind of, of mental psychotic health disorder problems. yeah no she just did it because then people were like oh well sh- that's just crazy bet like she just does stuff yeah like she that. does weird stuff yeah and so everyone just massively underestimated her because she acted mad and also just like sometimes she would just be like a flighty woman at parties mm. and everyone was like oh that's just her and so <laughs> crazy she bet at it again get away with stuff so obviously though mary's in a very precarious position because if yes. anyone catches her doing sneaky things they're gonna kill her and yeah. not even just because she's a spy just because they're racist yeah and she's so, therefore dispensable in that way yes so she had to have really sneaky ways of getting messages out to mm the union people i keep wanting to call them the rebellion <laughs> like which i don't well know in a that way it's... that that's kind of what they are but they kind of are but they have a name yeah <laughs> but i'm like the rebellion one of the ways that she would contact them is if she had an urgent message she would hang a red shirt on the washing line mm. and then she would take one of verena jefferson davies's wife yeah she would take one of her dresses to be altered, but she would have, and this she is Mary, would have sewn into the lining her messages. Oh. Yeah. And then the seamstress was in with the unionists and she would pass the message on to Elizabeth, who would oh. pass the message on to the military commanders. So cool. And so, like, I always find this as well in in sort of... um. I guess military conspiracies or just situations where people have to be sneaky and are ultimately in the enemy's hands. Um, it, people are so brave because, especially sure. as you say, especially Mary, because her life is held with less value in that place and time, and therefore she's risking yeah. everything straight off. And also, she completely had the option to say to Elizabeth, "Do you know what? Send me to Philadelphia." She didn't have yeah. to be doing this. Yeah, you know? just a cool cool lady yeah i knew you'd like go her. mary when you were like oh i don't know if i what she did i'm like you'll like her don't For some worry. reason i assumed she was going to be an aristocrat serial killer i don't know why Ooh, next episode yeah, tune so, in. a lot of this we don't really know how much mary contributed but there are suggestions she did a lot um the reason we don't know is because a lot of the information and messages that mary passed on were destroyed 
immediately Mm. and Elizabeth never stated her source because if one word got out that it was Mary in the Confederate White House, then she's going to be killed. Yeah. So um, I feel like it's pretty standard for spies is yeah. you destroy evidence that it's them because otherwise yeah, uh, they're not a very good spy. No. So, well, they're a good spy. It's just everyone else is let down. But um, as I said, Elizabeth's diaries reveal that Mary and other black spies that were installed in influential households have, quote, given the most reliable news, mm. which would make sense because, again, they're the ones who are allowed to be privy to conversations yeah, yeah. because everyone's rude and think they're stupid now we move on to the most treacherous part and this is the part that everyone thinks is lies but i'm going Ah. with it because okay no one no one wants your boring stories okay no it probably wasn't boring anyway but yeah if you honestly come here to be educated eh, if you come here to be entertained cool (laughs) yeah if you came here to be educated please go back to school but um (laughs) no so um a lot of theories suggest that Mary came up with these stories or told them and embellished them. So I feel like Mary would want us to tell this version of events rather than yeah. another one. So that's what I'm going to do. But um, well, what she so did do, Mary... I feel like Mary deserves for us to tell the things that she maybe didn't do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in January 1865, Davies arrested another spy in the ring who was a baker who Mary often passed messages through. I really hope they baked messages into the bread i don't know what happens to the baker but mary believing she's about to be found out fled however on her way to fleeing apparently she made a big fire in the basement of the confederate white house oh my god (laughs) and set fire to it yay brilliant Um, that's that's an odd thing to have made up though if she did make that up because like surely if she's telling this at the time, people would just be like, well, no, you didn't because it's it's there or like, you know. Yeah, so um, apparently it didn't do a lot of damage. Right, okay. <laughs> but she gave it a good go. It ruins the fun. Yeah, yeah, like she did a fire. That's yeah, good. bold attempt. <laughs> yeah. So then Mary escaped to Elizabeth and then fled north on a horse and cart and her disguise was that she was covered in horse manure. <laughs> 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 um, hey you what was so the setting bowser bowser she's like hey you mary bowser no no i couldn't be you see i'm covered in all this horse poo oh you're right no mary bowser isn't covered in horse poo we never got that in her <laughs> description so it's like that's circumstantially it'd be like are you mary bowser no no see i'm wearing a green dress god you're right she, she doesn't wear green dresses what are we thinking like someone could have in fact, put on either a green dress or some poo. Mm, but sure. I wonder, my first thought was like, maybe no one would approach her because she's covered maybe. in poo. It's like when I walk my dog, sometimes I don't throw his poo away immediately because I think if someone comes near me and like tries to get you can at me, just be like swinging around. <laughs> I would just throw the poo at them and run. It's kind yeah. of like, um, you know, evasive tactics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. We've talked about know. evasive tactics before, I feel like, on here. <laughs> it's just that thing where you're supposed to just do the weirdest thing you can think of and then run. Yes. Yeah. Also, um, now this is worse for sure than throwing mm. poo at someone. But I have considered if someone like really was trying to murder me, I'd put the poo in the palm of my hand and like <laughs> break their nose with my hand. Oh, Christ. Yeah. I mean, that would uh, probably act as a deterrent. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, having a broken nose, that's going to put you off kill- killing someone or make you more angry. But if you also have dog poo in your nose and eyes... You just got so overwhelmed nose, with bad sensations. Yeah, overwhelm them. <laughs> overwhelm the murderers. Mary fled. And that is apparently the end of it, but it oh. isn't. Oh. So... At the end of the Civil War in 1865, Elizabeth was personally thanked by the Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Oh, what a great name. I feel like I've heard that name. Probably. Probably. He was he's a Union the General. Union General. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he said to her, quote, shall I do a little voice? Yeah. <laughs> 
you have sent me the most re- oh no i got it wrong <laughs> you have sent <laughs> you have sent me the most valuable information received from richmond during the war oh very good he said you have sent me the most valuable information <laughs> received from richmond during the war just giving myself options in the edit <laughs> which is also like good for elizabeth reflects very well on mary as well mm. because every like so she will have heard davies and his commanders being like okay so we're gonna go to i don't know tennessee and have a punch up i don't know what they do <laughs> uh. but um then <laughs> mary will have been like they're going to tennessee for a punch up and yeah. then all of the people are like there's gonna be a punch up in tennessee and then they go and then there is or not i don't know how fun it's good. You've, you've just explained the purpose of a network of communication. Yes, I know, I know. But imagine, imagine being that who's like the person mm. who everyone's acting on your information. That's true. And if she had, I mean, I don't, a lot, I don't know why she would have, but that's a lot resting on her. And that if she chose to, she could have completely scuppered it and sent false messages and lost yeah, them everything. So a great position of trust. After the war... Elizabeth had basically run out of money because she spent most of it running the spy ring. Mm. Um, She was abandoned by her community, who was a community of racists. Uh. um, So we don't mind. And (laughs) um, on her deathbed in 1900, she told Mary's story to a reporter. Mm. Because up until this point, she hadn't said the names of anyone she did mm. she still didn't say mary's name but she said there was this woman yeah. and um she described her intelligence and all of the work she did and an article was written about mary and later Aww. elizabeth's niece annie rudolph hall identified mary to the press as bowser which a lot of historians are annoyed about because they're like that wasn't her name for all the time and it's like <laughs> oh, she did her best like annie didn't know she wasn't even born when all of this was happening yeah no Hear me. Um, oh, that's really cool. I'm so, glad that um, Elizabeth sort of thought to give her the credit at sort of the latest possible moment when it was safest, but still to yeah. Do that. I I think that in doing that, Elizabeth was trying to protect Mary because yeah, there still would have been very angry people roaming the country. Anti unionist sentiment. Yes. However, Elizabeth did all of this to protect Mary. Mary had no such thoughts <laughs> because. <laughs> There's some confusion about what what Mary did after the Civil War, because, as I said, some people think that she fled north, Mm. but almost immediately she she, she, (laughs) she shows up in the south teaching um, freed slaves and children. So we're not sure if she did go north. You know, her magical escape in the poop? No one's sure. (laughs) Um, Maybe she just went in a circle. She wanted people to see like a f- figure covered in poo and soot <laughs> flying yeah. north. And then as soon as she's like out of sight, she just kind of rounds the corner and goes and washes up in a schoolroom and is like, right, chapter two. Yeah, maybe. Um, so there's evidence that she taught in Georgia and Florida hmm. and she taught day and night school. And she was now going by Mary Ann Richards. This is where I find it weird that Elizabeth waited so long to credit her, but Mm. maybe they were just, I don't know. But she then appears to have travelled across America in 1865, busy year for Mary, lecturing about her experiences during the war under the name Richmonia Richards. (laughs) Oh, I mean, no offence to Mary, but like, why would you pick a name that just doesn't exist? I think because it's a you know it's a cover name, isn't it? They, she doesn't want to be like, "Hello, I'm Mary Ann Richards. Please yeah, come but this find thing my is... house and burn it down." But like, why would you? But but why would you then go with such an obviously fake name? <laughs> like, what's your name, Richards? What's your first name? Oh, Rich Moan. Uh, it is one of those Mona. where it's like, "My name is Table," and it's like, yeah, exactly. to "Table." When you said that, it's like, "I'm Table Tableson." That yeah, exactly. Um, like, I just wonder, think though, of if... any other female name, Mary. <laughs> no, but I wonder if she did it because she was working in Richmond and everybody knew Richmond to be oh. the Confederate capital. Oh, uh, so maybe. She's like, hey, I'm super cool. And then yeah. um, 
So in these talks, she's advertised as talking about how she organised schools for freedmen and also talking about her contacts with the Secret Service. (laughs) Um, However, in classic spy style, yeah, in classic spy style, she often contradicted herself from one lecture to another, which is why no one exactly knows what happened because people took notes from the talks but then the next talk she was like oh yeah so I didn't do this I did this and it's like oh okay Mary Mm. um so what happened but you know that's quite fun though it's like she's found a way to have her cake and eat it in terms of telling her adventures she's like I not only do I get to say what actually happened I also get to say 10 things that didn't happen but would have been equally cool and then yeah. no one can actually like accuse me of what happened because I can be like, yeah, I said that. But I also said this, this and this. And who can say what's well, true? Oh, yeah, that's really clever. So she's made up loads of lies. So no one knows exactly what she did do. Yeah, so, exactly. Hmm, yeah, that's clever. So she was apparently also massively sarcastic and very funny, which, <laughs> you know, it's just a fun little side note to get to know. Her. That's cool. So Mary last shows up in the historical record in 1867. First, in a meeting with abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe in Georgia where she told a version of her story right no one's sure which parts um and secondly through a letter so she was still employed as a teacher at this time and she was writing to her employer in education where she informed him that she was moving to join her quote new husband in the West Indies um oh end quote and that her married name would be mary jr garvin and that's the last we ever hear of her damn so did she presumably move to the west indies well yeah she could have done or she could have stayed in america and just gone you know elsewhere yeah um but nobody knows what she did because i'm sure like and here's the thing like i'm sure if you really really tried you might be able to find her on a Mm. ship going either to the West Indies or not Mm. but I mean historians is historians (laughs) exist and they haven't so yeah no one knows oh what an amazing lady that's so cool thanks for listening to the other Martha's podcast the show where a drama student and a film graduate talk about things we have no business knowing about if you enjoyed today's episode please do rate and review on all of the various websites and subscribe slash follow our channel for more lots of love bye Thank you.